Hi, hello, bonjour, and namaste. This is Out of the Clouds, a podcast at the crossroads between business and mindfulness. And I'm your host, Anne Mulatala. So in the daytime, I am a communications consultant, a specialist in storytelling strategies, as well as a coach. We could round this up by saying that I am an independent consultant. Now, bridging these three things, coaching, consulting, and storytelling is kind of like my superpower. So I help businesses and creative professionals figure out how to talk about themselves and what they do in a way that will make them relevant to the people that they care about. Now, in the evenings and weekends, I write, I teach, and study mindfulness, loving kindness, compassion, and yoga. And so in the middle, tying this all together, I host and produce this podcast, Out of the Clouds. The show is like me. It sits at the crossroads between business and mindfulness, or perhaps I should say mindful living or mindful working. My goal is to bring you insightful conversations that hopefully will inspire a reflection on living with intention. So that was about me, in case you're new to the podcast. Now about my guest for today. Chris Shambra is the Wall Street Journal best-selling author of Gratitude Through Hard Times and Gratitude and Pasta. USA Today calls him their gratitude guru. He is a founding member of Rolling Stone Magazine's Culture Council, and he sits on the executive board at Fast Company Magazine. Chris blends heartfelt storytelling with data-driven insights to deliver impactful keynote addresses and advisory services. He founded 747 Gratitude Experiences, which we'll talk about in depth, an evidence-based framework that he uses to strengthen client and team relationships in very profound ways. His expertise has led him to collaborate with the kind of industry giant most people dream of. We're talking about the Google, Microsoft, the US Navy, among others. Chris and I were introduced by our common friend, Danielle. And while I expected this to be a very interesting conversation, after all, the topic of gratitude is one that's near and dear to my heart. Nonetheless, this interview, this conversation was a a real surprise because I discovered just how wonderful a storyteller Chris is. I'm so excited for you to be discovering this conversation. Now, we cover a lot of ground and the initial file was two hours and 45 minutes, so I have managed to trim it down. (laughs) So among the many things that we cover, Chris tells me about his memory loss due to ADHD medication. We talk about the epic parties at his parents' home and how his mother is the ultimate hostess. We talk about careers or the beginning of our careers and how important it is to start by making ourselves useful. And then we, of course, land on the topic of Rome and how making food and hosting a Roman-style dinner in New York City was the beginning of Chris's adventure with 747 and gratitude. We also talk a lot about the power of connection and belonging, uh, vulnerability, being seen, and the importance of creating safe containers for people to interact, particularly when building Gratitude experiences like Chris does. But of course, there's much more than that. And I cannot wait for you to listen to it all. So without further ado, I give you my conversation with Chris Shambra. Happy listening. Chris, thank you so much for being here. And welcome (laughs) to Out of the Clouds. I'm so excited to be here with you. I had the opportunity to get to know you through our, our dear friend, Danielle, and what you bring into the world, helping people tell their authentic stories through a holistic way. I just think that the world needs so much more of your craft. So it's a pleasure to be here with your questions and you creating this safe space for my story. So thank you for that. I'm so excited for us to talk. 
as I was saying to you offline just before we got started, I've spent the weekend listening to your first book on Audible. And so I'm very familiar with your voice. It feels like I'm just mm-hmm. <laughs> meeting a friend, which is really fun. Uh, it's, a, it's a good way to get started for a podcast interview. So as you may already know, what I love to do is to start by asking my guests to tell their story. And what I mean by that is to hear about who you were as a kid or as a teenager, mm. what you used to dream of, what you, <laughs> whatever it was, and uh, how you came to be the person you are today. And I know it can feel like a tall order, but you're also a very well-versed speaker. So I'm sure that you're <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm in good hands here. So if that's okay, um, Chris, would you tell me your story? I would be remiss to tell you my story of upbringing without reading a passage from my favorite childhood book. Awesome. For all of you listeners out there who can't see the physical book, I'm holding a copy of a book called The Prince of Tides. It's written by an author named Pat Conroy. It was big number one New York Times bestseller. It, it was then turned into a movie with Nick Nolte and Barbara Streisand. And it's uh, my favorite book of all time. Why? It's a, it's a big, sprawling type of saga of a novel. But it's if Michelangelo was from the South, he would, he would have written, he would have chiseled, you know, the statue of David in these words that Pat Conroy wrote about my, my part of the world, South Carolina. I want to read part of the prologue to give you a flavor of my upbringing. My, my wound is geography. It is also my anchorage, my port of call. I grew up slowly beside the tides and marshes of Colleton. My arms were tawny and strong from working long days on the shrimp boat in the blazing South Carolina heat. Because I was a wingo, I worked as soon as I could walk. I could pick a blue crab clean when I was five. I had killed my first deer by the age of seven and at nine was regularly putting meat on my family's table. I was born and raised on a Carolina sea island, and I carried the sunshine of the low country inked in dark gold on my back and shoulders. As a boy, I was happy above the channels, navigating a small boat between the sandbars with their quiet nation of oysters exposed on the brown flats at the low watermark. I knew every shrimper by name, and they knew me, and they sounded their horns when they passed me fishing in the river. I read that passage because my soul is in that salt marsh. Mm. My soul is in the land of South Carolina, Mm. whether it's the dolphins that are working together to strand feed, whether it's the piping hot sand of our amazing Atlantic Ocean beaches, whether it's the throngs of tourists that come to our island every single summer for generations. I was born and raised on a South Carolina sea island, my shoulders inked in dark gold from the sun of the low country. And I love my upbringing. I had two amazing parents I had some fantastic friends, great family friends, great school friends. I involved myself in a number of uh, community activities, philanthropic activities, sports activities. I think I made the best of it. The funny thing, though, about my upbringing is I physically don't remember most of it. I physically don't have memory Mm. of some 15 years of my life. That's crazy. See, when I was a kid, I was very energetic. I had a lot of questions about the world. And that scared a lot of people. And this new thing called ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder, was starting to become a thing. There were books being written about this 
hyperactivity in children. And I started being driven what seemed like every Saturday up to Charleston to meet with a psychiatrist. And at the conclusion of my programming with this or evaluation with the psychiatrist, he said, you need to be on ADHD medicine. And they gave me such a high dosage of ADHD medicine, amphetamines, that it physically blocked my memory receptors from those 15 years that I was on that medicine from the ages of five until I got off at the age of 20. My life on the outside looked absolutely fantastic. But in the inside, I think I was screaming and I didn't know what to do about it. And so I grew up in a wonderful place with loving, loving parents, but I just didn't know how much I was screaming on the inside. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that. How do you reconcile missing such a piece of your personal history? How do you walk in the world without that? I walk around with a hunger and I walk around with a tremendous amount of curiosity and empathy, hopefully, and uh, definitely a little bit of anger, guilt, regret, shame for those different chapters. I have to rely on the memory of others from my childhood to tell me what did or did not happen. I always refer to uh, my childhood best friend, Randy Faree, as my memory. Different people from my childhood will say, remember when we did that thing? And I say, no, I actually don't remember. So that sometimes makes me pretty angry. Now as an adult, I don't process those emotions the most effectively as an adult. And so it's led to a number of things, multiple stints in rehab, multiple non-suicidal self-injury episodes, living in reckless abandon not being content with myself. A lot of things that a lot of people deal with on a daily basis and it manifests itself in a different way, but it it also gives me a tremendous hunger to go out and see the world and experience as much as I can experience now because I know what it's like just to not remember the experiences of the past. Yeah, of course. That makes so much sense. Now, I read a beautiful passage I think it was in your first book. It's called, I think, Gratitude and Pasta, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And you wrote about how your parents used to throw these amazing dinner parties. Mm -hmm. And first of all, I want you to know that the way that you described them, I felt like I was honestly transported somewhere else. So I feel like I've had a glimpse of this piece of your childhood. Was it relayed to you or is this something that you remember yourself? The dinner parties? Yeah. I do remember those. Uh, My mother, Carol, and my father, Phil, both had two of the biggest and most generous hearts on our island. They loved everybody. They'd give you the coat off their back. They'd loan you money. They'd volunteer their time for your cause that, that, was, that had nothing to do with what they loved in life, right? They were there for everybody. And one of the things that they loved doing was gathering people. And so it seemed they didn't need any kind of excuse to throw a party, to host a dinner. And what was so fun, not only was it fun seeing the people that would attend the dinners, but I actually remember love, I loved volunteering to help out the staff. I know that sounds like a very first world problem or thing to say, <laughs> but we always hired the same people. We had the bartender, I think his name was Mike. Mike would come into to our home and there's a guy that's there to do a thing and I didn't want to attend the parties. I just wanted to volunteer to be bar back in my own home for this guy named Mike. I loved, I loved the chefs that we'd bring in. I loved the people, the cleaners, the party preppers. I loved that part of the dinner. 
and it, it brought so much joy to people. It brought together people from out of town, from in town, and really created a hodgepodge of people that would normally not ever associate themselves with each other, but they came together at the Shemba family home. Mm. And your mother was the hostess, right? I didn't, yeah, my mother is the consummate hostess. She has a closet in her home. It's funny, I don't think I've ever talked publicly about this, but she has a closet and many other uh, cabinets <laughs> throughout the home, but she has an entire uh, closet that's the hostess closet. It's a big, it's a I've big thing. That. It's great. Maybe we'll get a photo of it and text it to you for the show notes. But if you need a Hawaiian theme something or you need a Japanese theme something, if you need an Italian theme something, or if you need uh, just a Southern theme something, you could go to that room. As a matter of fact, when Molly and I, my partner Molly and I, when we host a themed party here in New York, instead of going to smartyhadaparty.com and getting new party things for our party, I just call up mom and say, mom, I know you've got some 80s Japanese something in that closet. We're doing a sushi party. Can you send some stuff up? We'll bring it down next time we come down. And and, and so she had that abundance of uh, materials, of goods, thousands of candles, votives, tall candles, small candles. There was an entire room of just candles. It was amazing. I can see why you had such a connection to these events. It sounds amazing. I want to tell you that my mom was a really wonderful cook. We would only host for eight or 10 people at home. And I was the kitchen helper. I became a good cook because I just would not, I would just want to be part of what was going on. And Mm -hmm. since the only thing I could do was to help her in order to stick around, the kitchen was very small. So in order to make myself accepted, I made myself useful. Ooh, write that down, folks. <laughs> uh, if you want to make yourself accepted, make yourself useful. Yeah, which reminds me, actually, now it echoes a story from your first book. Ah, who was that guy who is now a, a really big shot producer and who his best friend took him on the set of Star Wars, telling him he was going to be a oh production my God. assistant. Oh my and God. And instead, he ended up being Carrie Fisher's companion and he was mortified. Yeah, so that, that is, we've remained in touch. His name's Charlie Wessler. Mm-hmm. I met Charlie when my friend Ilva and myself were doing, we had a column that we would do together in a big Swedish, the number one Swedish magazine or the, the called, um, I forget what it was called. We would interview these wonderful people and she would do the photo shoot with the person and I'd do the interview with the person while she was doing the photo shoot. So it was a very interactive kind of, comp- it was a wonderful one-two punch. And Charlie Wessler, when he was a kid, Charlie, Fish- Charlie Wessler, when he was a kid, his, he was actually best friends with Carrie Fisher, the great actress that played Leia in yeah. Star Wars. And they knew each other before Carrie was Carrie. And Carrie gets a call that Star Wars was happening. And she said to Charlie, hey, I think you're going to hate this film. It looks crazy. It looks like it's not going to amount to anything, even though they say it will. But if you want, I can negotiate for you to come over to London as my companion and they'll fly you over and you can just be with me during the photo shoot. And Carrie arranged for Charlie to come be her buddy in London during the filming of Star Wars. And Charlie gets there and... Essentially, the film production says, all right, we know you're here. You made it to London, but you can't really come on set with Carrie. So go figure out what you can do. And he just spent a bunch of time in London just doing nothing, just hanging out, seeing the town, having fun. Carrie was like, yeah, go, just go explore. Well, all of a sudden he got bored of that, right? All of a sudden he's like, I didn't come here just to hang out in London. I want to be part of this movie. And he kept on applying to be a film production assistant. 
And they kept turning them down. They're like, no, you're Carrie's friend. You've never done film production before. You're not going to work on Star Wars. And they kept turning them down. And then one day, he went up to the woodworking shop. Mm. And he volunteered to cut wood. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, he went over to the metalworking shop and he volunteered to help the metal workers slip a piece of rubber over a metallic hand that would end up becoming Yoda. And then he (laughs) did the next guy and then he did the next thing. And then anyways, a couple days later, word started getting around this set. This little kid, this guy that was Carrie's friend was just volunteering for everybody. And the production office called him in. And they said, you can't keep volunteering. This is like a union-based shop. This is Star (laughs) Wars. And he said, I'm not going to stop doing what I'm doing. I want to be useful. I want to be helpful. They said, fine, you're hired. And what started off there, production assistant on Star Wars, because he bullied his way in with volunteerism, now he's ended up becoming an Academy Award winning producer. He produced the 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 Green um, with Vigo Mortensen. He, he's produced he produced Dumb and Dumber. He produced Me Myself and Irene. Hundreds of great movies. I, I'm not doing his biography justice because I <laughs> I haven't thought about the story in a long time. The moral of the story, folks, is if you want to go get an opportunity in life, just go be useful. Just go and bull yourself in with volunteerism. And pretty soon, if you're really good at what you do, they'll say, can we just hire you? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. It's funny how that weaves its way here. But it's interesting to see the way that you tell the story. You actually told more than what was in the book. But I was, I was on the treadmill in Paris over the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> listening to that's, you and I feel like I'm back in that same room but it's so funny I was literally in between meetings I just thought let me get a little bit of working out there's a lot of pastries you know what I mean and then that, there you are telling me that story and now I feel like I'm, it's, I'm the same room it's funny that but by the way that's the great that's the great opener Char, Charlie when as you're listening because I'm going to send this Charlie listen to that opening line of your next film. I was on a treadmill in Paris. Mm, Now that's a movie, folks. It was a good looking treadmill as well. (laughs) Good looking, Jim. So I'd like to talk a little bit about Rome. (laughs) You have some Italian Italian blood in you, as Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're going to, to tell us about. But I believe that Rome played a really big part in your journey. And I had the pleasure of spending a lot of time there for a good couple of years, pre-pandemic. And so I'd love you to tell me about your experience of Rome, what it meant to you, what it was like. What, what brought you to Rome? It was a palate cleanser after Paris. <laughs> I worked in Paris for a couple of years and... I was on the verge of burnout at the time and I wasn't sure where I wanted to spend the rest of my time. I'd lived in the UK, the US, and that brought me to France. And I just thought, if you're not feeling great about life, Rome can fix that for you. At least that's what I figured. If you're not feeling great about life, Rome can fix that. What part of Rome could fix the way someone lives or thinks about life the best? What part? (sighs) All of it. (laughs) For me, (laughs) people, it's, I read one word in your book where I heard it. Tranquila is what they said when I arrived. Uh, I was thinking, but I want to do this and I can't do that. And how is that possible? And they were like, hey, Lady, tranquilla, che, it's okay. <laughs> it was the, the Southern Italian attitudes that I find comforting, that I mm. wanted to spend time. Also, I had the pleasure of having some clients at the time that were based or in and out of Italy and Rome. So it was, uh, I had an excuse work-wise as well. It helped. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so how did you know oh, but no, no, Nobody needs a true excuse to get back to Rome. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I made it to Rome. Uh, yes, I have Italian heritage. My grandfather is from Sicily. 
My grandmother's family is from a little town called Salerno at the armpit of the Amalfi Coast, as we call it. Yes, I've got some good friends from there. Ah, it's a good Mm. town. It's a tough town, very gritty town. Mm. But my journey to Rome started in 2015. So just for context for your people, I had been involved in the theater industry from 2011 to 2015. And one of the plays that we loved producing the most was this one-man play about Fiorello LaGuardia, the former mayor of New York City. LaGuardia Airport, he was a three-term mayor, he was a seven-term congressman, he spoke eight languages, he had seven secretaries. He was amazing. And so we traveled around producing that play, and one day we received the opportunity from two great Italian men, Alessandro Longobardi and Gianni Bozzacchi, to say, come to Rome, Come with your play. We put on the play for the people, La Guardia. There's actually a street in the central park of Rome. It's called Villa Borghese. Mm -hmm. There's actually a street called Viale Fiorello La Guardia. There's a street named after him. Wow. And so we said, yes, let's go and put on this play. So we made it over to Rome. The months leading up, everything was just... Rome, 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 the whole monthly. I learned the language. We had three people in our office in New York that were Italians. We had our whole production staff over in Italy that were Italians. I was being immersed in this culture. And then I finally get over to Rome and it did to me what it did to you, which was just completely changed my perspective on life. And we had a good time. We put on the play. We served the people. We had a positive message. We packed up our bags, and I came home to New York. And the minute that I landed in New York City, I said, holy crap, this ain't it. How I felt Mm -hmm. upon my return home to New York was not how I felt over in Rome. Rome made me come alive. And back home in New York, I realized, shit, I'm lonely. Mm. I'm unfulfilled. This is not the work I'm supposed to be doing. I am liable to go down a deep, dark path, right? The last time in my life that I felt lonely, unfulfilled, disconnected, insecure, all at once was in my early 20s. Led me down a deep, dark path of non-suicidal self-injury, multiple stints of rehab, jail, depression. And I said in that moment, gosh, golly, I got to do something quick or, or, or I'm done for. And so I really thought, what was it about my time in Rome that changed my perspective on living? Was it how they walked? No. Was it how they talked? No. Was it how they honored their 3,000-year history? No. It's how they ate their food with their friends amongst community. And I said, I got to bring more of that Roman style of dining and living and gathering back here to New York City. So I invented a pasta sauce recipe, and it was pretty decent, but I figured I should feed it to people to see if it was even good or not. And I decided to host a dinner party Mm. and feed it to my friends. July 15th, 2015, I invited 15 of my friends that didn't know each other over to my home for my simple bowl of pasta sauce. 6.30 p.m., cocktails began. 8 p.m., dinner was served. But at 7.47 p.m., We delegated 11 specific tasks, empowering the attendees to work together, to serve each other, to create the meal. And in that honor of the great city of Rome, La Città Eternal, we had a dinner party, Roman style, in New York City. And that kicked off the rest of my life. That's awesome. You hosted a Roman dinner party in New York City. Mm. 
in a 350 square foot studio apartment. <laughs> Folks, I want you to look around the room that you're sitting in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my apartment was smaller than that. Guaranteed. <laughs> the bed and a Murphy bed and then a two burner stove in the kitchen and the toilet right next to it. That was it. So what we did was we put out a th- three different four foot tables to make a 12 foot long table. And we'd put six people on each of the lengths of the table and then two people on each end of the table. And folks, I kid you not, the apartment was just big enough that you'd have an inch of space between the dinner chairs on each of the sides and each of the ends. If you had to get up to use the restroom, you literally had to ask everybody to stand up just to squeeze through, (laughs) just to walk around and use the restroom. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, I think that's the most Roman part of your dinner. Deciding to have a party at home despite the space requirements. Now, I remember hearing that in the weeks that led up to you deciding to throw this party, you missed the Roman food a lot and that you spend time cooking. Were you a good cook before? I seem to remember that you were even trying out gelato recipes, which I'm very proud uh-huh. of. So this is a leading question. How's your gelato? I, I haven't cooked it. I haven't made it in yeah, years, probably seven or eight years. Yeah, I, I, um, was I a good cook? At the time, I knew how to cook pasta and make amaretto. And I knew how to make my own peanut butter. And oh, cool. I, I was learning how to make gelato. And so that's all I served at my very first dinner was I went to the store. I went to Fairway Market at 74th Street and Amsterdam Avenue on the Upper West Side of New York City. And I got one sleeve of crackers for 99 cents. I got one apple and then I got one wedge of brie. One wedge of brie. Uh That was the appetizer. And I watched the YouTube videos on how to cut the apples so that the apple looked fancy. And I'd make it into a swan. And if I was feeling generous, I'd get a second apple. And I'd just straight up just slice that apple. So that was the appetizer. The main course was four boxes of pasta at 99 cents each. And I'd buy a 106-ounce Nina tomato can Mm -hmm. that was $4.69. And then use that to make my sauce with the carrot and all that kind of stuff. And then one loaf of ciabatta bread split 16 ways. (laughs) (laughs) And then dessert originally was that homemade gelato, but dessert was, would eventually just become a pint or a gallon of, of the vanilla ice cream split 16 ways. And we would top it off with homemade peanut butter that the guests would actually make Mm. during the earlier portion of the evening when I'd get people to work together to create the meal. I'd get two people to come into the kitchen and make peanut butter. Mm -hmm. And then I'd get two other people to come into the kitchen and make homemade amaretto. And that was dinner. It was 50 bucks to feed 16 people. So inspired. (laughs) I love it. Now, I'll come back to 747 and I have a few more questions about that first dinner, but can you tell our listeners about the question that you asked your guests that evening and why it matters? Yeah. July 15th, 2015, 15 friends that didn't know each other were having pasta sauce. We're drinking good wine. We're sitting down talking about just God knows what. And then after everybody got done with their pasta and I started passing out the ice cream, 
I looked around and I said, I'd like to ask you all a simple question. And I made it up on the spot. Shut up. I (laughs) made it up on the spot. And I said, if you could give credit or thanks to one person in your life that you don't give enough credit or thanks to, or you've never thought to thank, who would that be? And I kid you not, I watched all 15 of those people. The minute that I asked that question, they took a, whoa, and they sat back in their chair and I could see their eyes looking away to some far off place in their mind, thinking about people past or present, positive or negative, tall or short, that they've never thought to thank. And then we went around one at a time and shared our answer, two to three minutes each per share. We're drinking the amaretto and we're having the dessert. And we're listening to these vulnerable shares. And I, I kid you not, everybody cried. And I said, oh my gosh, this is great. This is amazing. Let's do this next week. I'll invite new people. I'll ask this question again. And yeah, the birth of something right there because of that one question. Can you tell me what happened next? So, kept doing the dinners every week, once a week, for free. I was still working in theater. I was, I was running the theater company by day. We had just come back from producing a play in Italy. And I started these things a month late, two months later. So I was still doing theater. July, August, September. October, November, December. And then December of 2015, I quit theater. I said, yeah, theater wasn't it. I'm going to give this whole dinner table a shot. And I remember I went skiing on January, uh, Sunday, January 24th, 2016 with my buddy Dave and his family and his friends. And we went to snow sledding in Central Park after a big snowstorm in New York City. And we all went up to Dave's apartment after the snow sledding. And I just left theater. And we're having the conversation about what could come next in life. And he said, Dave said, so what are your options? I said, I could maybe just open up another theater company. I was pretty good at that. Or maybe I could go into real estate like my dad. Or maybe I could open up a marketing company. We just won a bunch of awards for social media marketing campaign that we just did. Or maybe I could do this, or maybe I could do that, or maybe I could see what happens around the dinner table and build something there. I don't know. And he said, you got to pick one. I said, why do I have to pick one? He said, you can't chase two rabbits at the same time. They'll both get away. Focus equals growth. So focus equals growth. Okay. He said, what do you think would have the best long-term potential or the worst long-term potential? I said, probably these dinners. He said, what do you think would be the hardest to do? I said, probably these dinners. He said, what do you think your people actually most know you for? I said, probably the dinners. He said, which one of these is your heart the most in 120%? So probably the dinners. <laughs> he said, I think you've got your answer. Mm. And from that moment on, I had one singular focus. Mm. Figure out how to make money by creating a safe space for people to gather. Mm. And that was it. Off we went. I I'm so grateful that you just told that story. I'm thinking that maybe, what's the name of your friend? Dave. 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 Wow. <laughs> Can I call Dave, Dave next time I have a doubt about something? You, you definitely should. <laughs> Dave has taught so many of us, Mike and Mahul and, and Derek and 
Martin and Niall and Jonathan and Trip and myself, so many things through the years, and Joe, so many things through the years, most notably systems are the solution, find extraordinary in the ordinary, and businesses don't grow, people do. And what he told me was that focus equals growth. And all of us that run companies now that had Dave as mentors, we all have those like four things as our values. Businesses don't grow, people do. Systems are the solution. Find extraordinary in the ordinary and focus equals growth. Wow. I'm so glad you've said that. I'm going to be writing this down. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I mean, Dave built like a couple thousand person company that did $500 million a year in annual revenue. He knows what he's talking about. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Oh, so... How, I have two questions. Let's start with a safe space. How did you become aware that creating a safe space, what yoga teachers and you <laughs> equally call a container, how did you become aware that this was something that was important for the success of these dinners? <sighs> Not everybody is aware that this is important. It'd be so cheap for me to just say gut instinct. Look, I listened to the responses of the people and I watched what they did after our dinners. I remember we used to keep, we used to keep track. Molly might know where these numbers are. And, and even in the early days, Niall might remember where those, these numbers might be. But we used to keep track of how many people went out after our dinners and quit their jobs. Oh, wow. <laughs> to pursue a life of passion. How many people broke up with their girlfriend, boyfriend? How many people finally said F you to that bad boss? How many people like did life-changing stuff as a result of how much they came alive at our dinners? And we used to keep track of it. We used to get emails all the time of people doing this. I remember one day, some wonderful gal came to our dinner table. Her name was Callie. And she was a big time thing in a big time place. And she came and she said to our gratitude question, if you never thought to thank, no, no, no. she said, I've never thought to thank my couch. Huh. I said, what? She said, yeah, I have really stressful days during the day. And then I come home and all I want to do is just turn on trash TV, eat a pint of ice cream and sit on my couch. And it's got me through a bunch of this stuff and boom and boom and boom. And she starts telling this amazing story and other people start telling stories and asking her questions and doing all these things. I thought I screwed up the dinner by letting everybody talk to her about their own personal stories when it should have really just been about her story and leave it at that. Sure. So I felt bad for the next couple months because I didn't hear from her we were just loose on email. And then I was at someone else's gathering. I was at John Levy's, who, who founded something called the Influencer Dinner Series. And I was, I was at one of his gatherings, one of his salons. And for some reason, he called out that I was in the crowd to all, a wonderful group of influential people. He said, oh, Chris, he's a young guy who's around the dinner table doing great things. He's in the crowd. Chris, stand up. I'm like, oh, I was the only one he called out. And all of a sudden, from behind me, I feel a bear hug. And I turn around, and this beautiful woman, great friend, Callie, was standing there. And she said, I'm so sorry that I haven't been reaching out over the last couple months. I got to say, your dinner table inspired me to do something big. I said, what? She said, it inspired me to quit the job that I was in and to say yes to an opportunity that was right in front of my face for a number of months. And that new opportunity was helping Ariana Huffington build, mm. launch, co-found her newest media publication called Thrive Global. Mm. And off Cali went. And it was such a great testimony of the power of what one small little positive psychology micro-intervention, a safe space in a communal format among strangers can do to like really engineer change in one, one's life. Mm, that's so inspiring. 
when or how did this become a business as mm. well? So, July 15th, 2015 to July 15th, 2016, we call that the 12 month for free period of time. So we hosted 54 dinners in 52 weeks, feeding 808 people for free in our home. All for free. And then we kept hosting the dinners every week, once a week for free in our home. But then the phone started ringing magically after that 12 month mark for the next six months, it started ringing and people would call us up and offer just enough money to pay our bills. So just enough money to break even. So I say the first 12 months was giveaway. Month 12 to month 18 was pay our bills. I mean, our first client was this guy, his name was Rob. Mm -hmm. And he was, he used to be a promoter at uh, a nightclub in New York City. So I knew him through the nightclub scene, even though I'm a short, not the best looking, average kind of white guy who was rolling up to a nightclub with no girls. And not only would they let me in, but they'd give me free bottle service. What? That's so awesome. It was so weird. And Rob was the one that, that really was the champion of that. I don't know what he saw in me, but we always had a good time and all that jazz. And he was starting a social club called Goldfinger. And he called me up and he said, I want to do a dinner party with 16 of my first members. I said, great, what's your budget? He said, $200. I said, awesome. I'm going to get paid $200 to host a dinner party? This is great. And that was my very first client. And so for those next 12 to 18, between the 12 to 18 month mark, we slowly, you know, increased the fee and we started just doing enough to break even. And then... On January 15th, 2017, the 18 month anniversary of our first dinner, I signed on the dotted line of a new client, a a billionaire from Florida, who who became our first true money-making client. And yeah, we were off to the races from there. That's wonderful. So I'd love to get a sense of where are the dinners now? Are they still happening? Who gets to go to them? Yeah, tell me about how the dinners evolved. Yeah, how the dinners evolved is a, is a wonderful journey. Um, what started off for free in our home for 16 people eventually morphed into being paid to produce these dinners. The dinners were sometimes a lot larger than 16 people. And sometimes I didn't even touch the food at all. And so from 2015 to Thursday, March 12th, 2020, we produced 262 dinners. 98% of what we got paid for was client engagement or customer dinners, which meant we were, bringing, we were being brought in by a company to help them engage or connect with their customers, their clients. And so whether that was around a 16-person dinner table or a couple hundred-person dinner table, the size started getting a lot bigger. And the other 2% was doing team building dinners and events, again, ranging from 20 people to three or 400 people. And what what ended up happening on Friday, March 13th, 2020 was COVID. And so COVID ripped away the dinner table. COVID ripped away our pasta sauce. COVID ripped away our commitment to in-person gathering. And so we were left sitting there saying, well, what are we left with? We can't gather people in person. We can't cook them our pasta sauce. We can't do these things that we're known for. There was one part of the recipe that COVID didn't take, which is our signature gratitude question. 
And so starting in six days after the world shut down, starting on Thursday, April 19th, 2016, 2020, sorry, while everybody was isolated and disconnected and working from home or trying to figure out what was going on, we decided to host a virtual gratitude, as we called it then, dinner. We said, get your food, come on Zoom, 7.47 p.m. Eastern, and let's have a good time. And we ended up producing those virtual gratitude dinners every single day for the first three or four months of the pandemic. And we ended up inventing this 90-minute, three-act experience filled with coming into the present, diving into the past, and then helping our people look ahead to the future with hopefully inspired hope, optimism, pride, self-confidence, self-efficacy. And that's how we ended up serving our our community for free in the couple months at the beginning of the pandemic. I'm not going to lie. I was on unemployment insurance. I just spent every dollar to my name on our first book was scheduled to be released April 7th of 2020. Oh. And it was a book about how to host an 18 person dinner that made everybody cry. And so that, that was irrelevant at the beginning of the pandemic. Yet I just spent all that money on the writing team, the editing team, the marketing team, the PR firm, all these kind of different things. Forbes called it the number two book of the year to create human connection. But then the pandemic hit. And so I had to go on unemployment insurance. I remember one day during the pandemic, at the beginning of the pandemic, we went to we went for cocktails. They were selling to-go cocktails all, all across New York City. And so me and Molly went for cocktails with my best friend, Scott, and his girlfriend at the time, Caitlin. They're now engaged, but his girlfriend at the time, Caitlin. And I remember walking up to a restaurant at Park Avenue and 18th Street and seeing the prices of the cocktails on the menu. And I said, guys, I just don't have that money. And Scott said, I got this round, buddy. Don't worry. And I knew then in that moment that we were going to be fine. And as what happened around the dinner table, the first go around back in 2015, once we started doing enough of them, the phone started ringing. And the first phone call that came in was from a a university. They wanted help to engage their alumni. They wanted to bring 100 people together per experience for four experiences. And their budget was $1,600. And I said, okay, I'll get paid $400 to produce an experience. This is great. The second phone call came in from a Fortune 50 bank, big bank, one of the biggest banks in the world that you've all heard of. And they had a problem. We got 2,000 interns, summer interns. We can't gather them in person. Yes, they'll learn things during the day at their job, but usually we help connect them through some kind of social activity at night. Chris, we need your help bringing them together in a meaningful way at night. I said, great, let's do eight experiences across four nights, two experiences per night to give them a social networking component of their internship. I said, what's your budget? They said, their budget. I said, good. It's a $49,000 deal for a couple hours of work in a week. And the minute that we closed that deal, I said, okay, we're going to be just fine. And we've since produced 402 virtual gratitude experiences since the start of the pandemic. And so you ask the question of what do those dinners look like now? Some of the stuff we do now is around the dinner table. We're going off on tour with Google starting this Thursday to bring together a bunch of Google Cloud customers in different regions for evenings of cloud food and gratitude. And 
some of the things we do are 2,000 person programs where we bring together people on a grand scale, virtually or in person. Mm-hmm. So it all looks different. Yeah. And we don't give ourselves enough time to continue hosting the free ones inside our home that we used to, but we're slowly getting back to that. So that was a very long-winded answer, but the dinners morphed into just being known for gathering people. Mm. Thank you. And now I want to stop this line of questioning to ask you, what is your fascination with dates and numbers? Because I cannot help but notice a certain amount of precision. <laughs> What's the story there? Yeah, I, I just think I had so much insecurity of not being able to remember so many different chunks of my life from the ages of five to 15 because the amphetamines that I was on, that now that I can remember these things, I have to use, I want to use dates and times to anchor memories. And I'm blessed and I'm privileged to have been able to do a lot of things since they took me off the amphetamines. And I like to keep them organized so that I don't forget. But now I want to ask, why 7.47? Why 7 p.m. and 47 minutes? The first dinner that we ever hosted on July 15, 2015, where we invited 15 of my friends that didn't know each other. Arrivals were at 6.30 p.m. Dinner was at 8 p.m. I wanted dinner served at 8 p.m. And pasta takes 13 minutes to cook al dente. Ah. So I put the pasta in the pot at 7.47 p.m. And then I delegated 11 other specific tasks empowering all the attendees to work together. So at that very first dinner, I had called two people into the kitchen to say, hey, you guys make the peanut butter together. Here's the food processor. Here's a bunch of peanuts. Here's honey and brown sugar and cinnamon and salt. Make it taste good. I brought two other people into the kitchen hey, let me teach you how to make amaretto. Here's the vodka. Here's the vanilla extract. Here's the almond extract. Here's the sugar. Do your thing. Hey, Joe, come here. Hey, Joe. Hey, Steve, come here. You guys, you see those tables? Go set them up. Josh, you see those chairs? Set up 16 chairs around Steve and Joe's table. So we did things like that with the napkins, with the people who were on trash duty. I'll never forget Monday, April 4th, 2016, we were doing a, an 18-person dinner party that turned into a 24-person dinner party at my friend Ryan Sweeney's mom's home in Carpinteria, California, right outside part of Santa Barbara. Mm-hmm. And we had two people. One was Sylvia Acevedo, who worked on the Voyager mission to Jupiter's moons. She was an executive at big tech companies and she was the CEO, global CEO of the Girl Scouts. And she made peanut butter that night with Barry Morrow, who won the Academy Award for writing Rain Man. Oh. And the two of them met Uh over peanut butter duty Mm. in order to serve our people. And not that they have egos, but you imagine two powerful people now are just working together to make peanut butter with four ingredients. Mm -hmm. It brings you back to the simplicity of life, Mm -hmm. right? When Sylvia was a Girl Scout member as a child, dreaming of big things through simplicity. When Barry was just a writer making skits as a kid, and now he's an award winner. So it brings people back to the simplicity of things. And that all happened at 7.47 p.m. And so now it's our, it's, it's our whole, it's our brand identity. It's actual tattoos on my body. It's, it's now, it's our angel numbers. When I see, I, I just ordered something, I just ordered something, a whiskey thingy on the internet from my friend Andrew. Cause I, when I think of whiskey, I think of Andrew, not that I'm calling him an alcoholic, but there's just the two go well together, a bourbon. And I looked at the order number. Order number 747. Mm. What? You can't make this up. I got it. People text me every single day at 747 a.m. and 747 p.m. saying they're thinking of me. Oh, that's awesome. Every time, every time that I'm thinking of doing something between a yes or a no, and I see 747 attached to it, it's an automatic yes. Mm. It's great. 
Molly, my partner Molly's number is blank, 7473. <laughs> awesome. It's the only reason we're dating. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Molly, Molly, I love you. Don't worry. <laughs> Now, I'm very happy you demonstrated how you actually ask your guests to do things. You delegate tasks, but you also explain it's wonderful, actually, a wonderful part of your first book. You go into a tremendous amount of detail to explain why it's important that you show that you're in charge and how to interact with the guests for someone who wants to Give this a try for themselves. And there's a lot of precision in the book that I think is really fun. I'm going to have to get a print copy. Although I did mark some bits on Audible about things that made me think. Did you develop this naturally? This notion that you need to be able to establish a certain authority in order for your guests to also feel safe we're seen. Tell me more. I appreciate that. I can think through my life and I can think of moments where I was given the gift of learning from a very precise person. And from the outside, people might call these people perfectionists or OCD or I don't know what kind of names you call these people, but to me, they're masters of their craft. I think that started with my dad is a very precise person when it comes to real estate. He's risen to great achievement by being very precise about his routine, about his philosophy, about his systems with remembering people's names and having note card files about every client he's ever had, etc. To then me being a kayak tour guide and a boat captain, I learned precision from Mike and Mickey two of the great leaders, Mike owned the company and and Mickey was one of my direct supervisors. And they were very particular with precision on how to talk about things and how to drive the boat this way and, and do the kind of things. And even when I was a kayak tour guide, I'd have these groups of 22 to 24 people. I'd be taking them on tours of the low country, tours of the salt marsh that I read in the introductory passage yes. from Pat Conroy. And you'd have oyster shells that, that if you weren't precise in how you led the group, your group could wander off and get cut on oyster shells or they could get attacked by something or I don't know, bad things could happen. So I learned to be very precise in how I would lead a tour and how I would know their names and how I would serve the people. And then fast forward to when I worked in theater and was working alongside this great man, Tony Lobianco. When I met him, I was 24 and he was 74. And we would then spend the next four years, 10 hours a day, six days a week, arguing and bantering and co-creating all these wonderful opportunities for people. He he was a master of his acting, directing, writing, craft. Every single word that was in a play we were producing was intentional. Every single movement, how we would put a prop, uh, and the prop had to face a certain way to minimize the movement needed to pick up the prop. Everything was very intentional. And so when I started hosting my dinners, I realized I needed to create intentionality, to create repeatability. I needed to create precision in order to create the most, the, the most operationally executional moment in human history. There's a guy named Will Guidara who oh, wrote a I book know. called... I adore yeah. that book. It's absolutely unbelievable. I have extra copies to give to friends. For all the listeners, Will... Mm. took a stumbling two Michelin starred restaurant. It's not like you're doing bad at two Michelin stars, but like he took a stumbling, bumbling restaurant called uh, 11 Madison Park in New York City. And within a number of years, him and his partner, uh, Daniel Hum, uh, built it into being the number one restaurant in the world. And he did that through a series of things that one would call unreasonable. (laughs) The attention to detail, the fanaticism 
of people's crafts that he expected, but the results Mm -hmm. are in the pudding. And everybody that worked at that restaurant in that period of time Mm -hmm. is now set for life because they came out with a certain pedigree. Mm -hmm. And so my goal is to help people around the dinner table wake up and realize if they can participate in a group experience where they're being led, where it's all right for them to turn off the brain and just be of service and follow directions and listen to others and co-create safe space and lean in with their heart. If they can do that because of the safe space that I've created through my intentionality and precision and through my kind of domineering control, what else can they do in their life from the metaphor of what happened around that dinner table? Where does that free them up to do in their life? I'm so glad I asked that question. And as you were, and I loved your answer. Thank you so much. Because as you were answering, I could see the pieces coming together. The dinners with your parents, your meticulous father, who's amazing at building name files and cars and the precision and the production chops that you had from the theater. It, It all makes so much sense. And I think it's beautiful because... I'm going to venture a guess that maybe 20-year-old you did not have much expectation of what your journey would look like 20 years later. But then all of the Uh, things that you did, all of the energy that you put out, ended up blending in in these amazing experiences and the communities that you're gathering together. I'll tell you what I wanted to be when I was 20. Oh, yeah. And by the way... I'm just telling this story so that people can get the the full context of how different my life has turned out to be since this one exact moment in time. But this entire podcast, I've told you that I don't physically remember ages five through 20. Specifically, I don't remember the, the physical details of my life for 15 years. I checked into my very first rehab I'll skip the stories that got me there, but I checked into my very first rehab on on May, May 14th, 2008, and I checked into rehab with a 30-day supply of those amphetamines. Oh, okay. And in order to give to the counselors because they wanted to keep me on the medicine for the first 30 days while they weaned me off the other stuff. Anyways, I was in a wilderness rehab program in the woods of Utah that was like a boot camp for convicts and mess ups and all that kind of stuff where we'd just be wandering around the woods going from point A to point B to get our new food rations every day. And along the way, we talk about the principles of AA and we talk about our stories and our past and we work with the counselors and do these things in the woods, in the middle of the woods of Utah. And those first 30 days, I had my Adderall. I, I had my goods. And then on the 31st day, it happened to be one of the days where I was living alone for four days on what's called a solo. It's a four-day period of time. Mm-hmm during that multi-month long program where the counselors actually placed the kids about a mile apart from each other for four days and just tell them to figure out how to stay alive for four days. And on the very first morning, my 31st day of being there, I get a note in my little mailbox that I had to make so that the counselors can write post-it notes to make sure you're still alive. The very first morning that I woke up, there was a note that said, no more medicine for you, smiley face. And it was the first number of days in 15 years, I didn't take my medicine. I was comatose for those four days. I didn't get out of bed. I pooped and peed less than five feet away from where I was eating. It was just a mess. I ate cold rice and beans if I was lucky. It was a mess. But then the days kept going on and I was still in that rehab. And one day I was sitting down with my buddy, Mitch Doty. And we were sitting up alongside a rock next to a riverbed in the woods of Utah. And he said, where do you see yourself in 20 years? I said, Mitch, 
I'm going to have a van and I'm going to be sitting down by the river and I'm going to learn how to play the guitar. And there's going to be people that are going to be coming down that river on their kayaks and they're going to pull off and they're going to hang out with me, with my van and my campfire. And that was my dream. That's the first time I ever saw a future for myself. When I was a kid, I never saw a future for myself. I didn't dream at night and I didn't dream into the future. Never did. Not once, not once at all. Mm -hmm. And that was the very first dream I had was the dream of sitting in a van down by the river, having a campfire with my buddy, Mitch. Wow. And, and I failed. I, my life did not turn out that way. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's interesting because it's got that community aspect to it. I'm going to grasp onto yeah. that thread and ask you, which I didn't think about asking you before. And we're going to talk about gratitude as well, because obviously we have to. <laughs> but what do you think has your impact been on, on the people who attended the first 12 months of dinners? Because you put people together in a room. Is there some kind of continued community through the years? Oh, yeah, of course. That's the best mm -hmm. part. So in that first year of those dinners, 54 dinners in 52 weeks, feeding 808 people for free in our home, two things happened that were both strategic on my part. Number one, every time I felt insecure, like I didn't have anything to offer, like I was falling behind in life, I would go into my email and the subject line would read, Chris connecting Bob and Sarah, Chris connecting Jezebel and Jasmine. I don't know if Jezebel is a bad word, but Jezebel and Jasmine, Ariana and Bob, whatever. And I would just connect people, connect, and they go on and do great things. And I really did the most of that in that first 12 month period. Mm -hmm. The second thing that I would do is after every single dinner, I go into the email and I'd say, Chris connecting attendees from September 4th, 2016 dinner. Mm. And everybody would on, be on that email thread, whether it was a 16 person dinner or a hundred person dinner or a 300 person dinner, they'd all be connected. July 19th, 2016, I hosted a 160 person dinner party at WeWork at 36th Street and 8th Avenue. Mm. And I created the email thread connecting 160 people. <laughs> and so every now and then one of those email threads will pop, will pop up someone just commenting in saying, Hey, what's everybody been up to? And I've personally seen people have built companies mm -hmm. chasing billion dollar deals. I've personally seen people start dating. I've personally seen people hook up. I've personally seen all these kind of different things. Mm -hmm. So it, yeah, there's definitely a long tail approach to it. Mm, thank you. Now, the subject of both your books, the first one that we've talked about quite a bit and the second one called Gratitude Through Hard Times, are really anchored around the original question and the notion of gratitude that really is, let's say, the, the cornerstone of, of what you do with these dinners and, and the virtual connections since then. For anybody who's listening to us who doesn't have a sense of what are the benefits of cultivating a gratitude practice in their life, what could you share with them before I tell them that they obviously need to go and buy both your books? <laughs> so let's first start with the definition of gratitude. We think quite simply gratitude is the acknowledgement of the benefits or the value that you've received from others in your life. It requires you to actually come into the present, take a pause, and think huh, I did get benefit from that. Whoa, I'm grateful for that. Now, the micro nuance here is that we believe it's better to practice gratitude to other humans instead of just things. So a lot of people, they sit there and they have a gratitude, uh, hey, I'm grateful for the sky. Hey, I'm grateful for the sun. I don't believe in that stuff. I believe, uh, as Barbara Fredrickson once said, to be grateful is to be grateful to someone. 
Gratitude is best practiced when it's to another living Mm. soul. Mm -hmm. And so the type of gratitude that we write about, that we've been researching, that we've been studying, that we've been helping wonderful people practice is not the self-reflective kind where, you know, you might have a gratitude journal and you wake up every day and you write down five things that you're grateful for and you do three things that you're grateful for at night and then you put that journal on the bedside table and nobody else but you reads it. Yeah, okay, that's cool. Yeah, I'm not going to knock that. But the type of gratitude that we write about, that we've been researching, that we've been studying, that we've been helping wonderful people practice is not the self-reflective kind where you know you might have a gratitude journal and you wake up every day and you write down five things that you're grateful for and you do three things that you're grateful for at night and then you put that journal on the bedside table and nobody else but you reads it. And there's tremendous health benefits that we write about. Uh, you know, it helps you sleep better. It helps lower, lower your cardiovascular stress. It helps you build more meaningful relationships. There's all these kind of wonderful things that, that, that you can read about in the book. But I, I just think it's a, a wonderful tool to help re- reconnect with people from your past or to help deepen connection with people in your immediate future, whether you're giving gratitude to a third grade teacher you haven't talked to in two decades, or you're giving gratitude to your wife that you see every single day, or you're giving gratitude to yourself. Science shows that when you perform an action of gratitude, whether it's through a letter or verbally or whatever it may be, it actually rewires your brain. Barbara Fredrickson is the researcher and she proved in the broaden and build theory of positive emotion that gratitude has the ability to actually broaden your thought action repertoire needed for positive affect. So it makes your brain more open for joy, contentment, play, connection. And I think that's something that's so important in today's day and age. Yeah, it really is. And I was grateful to be reminded of her when I was reading the second book because she appeared on regular occasions when I was studying to become a mindfulness meditation teacher. Gratitude was a part of the curriculum. And I have since this afternoon (laughs) reconnected with her through her Wikipedia and I will go and look at her work a little bit further. I was really fascinated by, by what I read. I was interested in asking you to tell me about your second book. So I now have more context. I understand that the first one came out talking about in-person gathering and in it, you really are giving all of your secrets away apart from the pasta sauce secret, which I think is only right. (laughs) Nobody gets that. Just as a brief side story, my, and then I promise not to interrupt you more, but my partner Molly used to work for a, a lovely actress by the name of Sarah Jessica Parker. And we would give sauce to all of Molly's co-workers every holiday. And every co-worker would love the sauce. And one day, Sarah Jessica said to Molly, God, I love the sauce so much. Me and Matthew, she's married to Matthew Broderick. Me and Matthew love the sauce so much. Is Chris able to share his recipe? And you know, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. Oh my God, share my recipe. Oh, oh, oh. I said, no. We'll just keep giving you more sauce if you want, but no, you're not getting my recipe. So <laughs> nobody gets my recipe. That's awesome. I just remembered, yeah, Molly worked for Sarah Jessica Parker's shoe line, right? Oh, yeah. Tell Molly I worked in shoes too. I was at Christian Louboutin for 17 years. That's who I worked for in London, New York, and Paris. <laughs> All right, I'm going to have to connect the two of you after this because this is going to be, uh, it's, woo, wow. That's fun. Um. Yes. Coming back to the books, tell me about the impetus behind the Mm. second book. Yeah, we wrote a book about the dinner table and we had all these wonderful things lined up April, May, June, July of 2015, going around the country and producing these dinners and speaking at different companies and doing all this kind of stuff with the book and with the principles and all this kind of stuff. All the momentum was leading up to that book tour. 
which was a kind of a dinner party tour with a bunch of clients. And oh, uh been so yeah. cool. Of course. I mean, we were we had some wonderful folks. The revenue per per event was absolutely fantastic. And we were really coming into the, the top of our game. And then yeah, the pandemic happened. We pivoted our book launch from doing it in person in New York City to virtual. And my friend Charles Michel facilitated our our virtual book launch. We had 3,300 or 3,100 people come to it. Um, It was cool. I I got to drink my friend Lauren and and Joshua and and Isaiah and Lynn, their their champagne, Sherlyn, a very low sugar, black owned champagne company. So I got to do all these fun things online and everything during the online book launch. I don't know. it, It didn't feel real. It just felt like a fugazi, fugazi, it's a woozy, it's a wazi. The May, the June, the July, the August, the, all these kind of things. Throughout 2020, I was producing so many virtual gratitude experiences for companies, right? And we were doing eight a week. We'd do five in a day. It was a ton, but I didn't meet because it was a pandemic. I never met a single one of those people that we served. I never met a single one of people that these companies had bought our books for. I never met. It was just fake internet stuff. And I'll be the first to admit it. Ego, insecurity, Uh the feeling of not seeing my baby, my book baby, Mm -hmm. in people's hands by 2021, the next year, I said, I got to overcome this insecurity, this la- this ego thing. Let me just go write another book. I had the idea to do that in March of 2021. My dad went back into the hospital with complications from COVID. And I remember sitting at my dad's yeah, hospital bed for those couple days. He's doing great. But I remember sitting at at his hospital bed as they were working on his blood clots and I looked at him as he was right next to me and I'm in the hospital chair and I looked and I was like, it's morbid to say, but I was like, what's my dad's legacy? Here's a legacy of a guy who's built a community that's entertained millions of tourists and has sold hundreds of homes and is the top in his craft at real estate. But he's also got this other part of him, this this motivational publishing company that he started in 1979 with my mom where he writes life learning material just like what I write about. And they come in the form of eight and a half, 11 by 11 day planners. And I said, my dad's legacy is not real estate. My dad's legacy is his writing and all the wonderful people he's met through his writing and coaching people and speaking at wonderful organizations and all these kind of great things. And I said, I got to dive into that and I got to write a book in honor of him. And so I called Sarah, my writing partner at the time. She was, a, she helped me organize and she was the contributing author to my first book. And I said, let's go into business again together for my second book. Uh, I'll never forget. I called her from the hospital and I said, let's write another book. And that was it. And, you know, it was, it was mainly to cure my insecurity from the previous book. We definitely rushed into it. Yeah, it was weird, but it's what it was. Mm. It's very sweet because the last chapter is about legacy. <laughs> and it's, oh, yeah. I really like the last three or four prompts. Because each chapter is ended with uh, reflection prompts and action prompts. And Mm. you are asking us to think about our own legacy. And I think that's... Mm. uh, I've thought about it before myself. But for anyone who hasn't, it's a very direct way to answer some uh, important questions for yourself. Oh my gosh. Yeah, the... um Sandy Gibson, Better Place Forwards. 
You can't pay it back. You have to pay it forward. Keep mm-hmm. the legacy alive. Oh my gosh. Give yourself the gift of 30 minutes each week writing about your legacy. Mm-hmm. What do you, yeah, I mean, uh, by the way, great gratitude and credit to our wonderful friend, Court Roberts, mm-hmm. who is the one that worked with us on creating those two reflection and then action, the two reflection questions and then the action step mm-hmm. in each, uh, she calls them gratitude inquiries. Mm-hmm. So she designed that whole program. That's wonderful. Now, as the podcast is at the crossroads between business and mindfulness, one of the things that I like to ask my guests is to tell us about, let me back up. Mindfulness is a state. You can be mindful. It's a trait that you can adopt. And it's also a lens, right, through which you you can look at life. And I like to keep this broad, but I like to find out what are the things that help you feel more grounded, that help you feel more aligned with yourself or perhaps to a higher power, something spiritual. Basically, what works for you apart from Mm. gratitude? Because we've covered Mm. that one. A whole litany of things. My earliest mindfulness practice started in February of, I need to figure out the exact date, but I had a neighbor at my one-person WeWork office at 36th Street and 8th Avenue and my neighbor Katya came in to me one day at 11.27 a.m. And she said, hey, you want to meditate? I said, what do you mean? She said, I just downloaded this new app. It was called Headspace. It was all the rave. She said, I'm going to meditate in a couple minutes. Want to meditate? I said, sure. And so I went and banged on the new mother's room the kind of like the where sure. moms go at WeWork mm-hmm. and nobody was there. So we went in and turned on the first episode of Mindspace, mm-hmm. episode one, season one, exercise one. Mm-hmm. And for those next couple months, Katya and I meditated every day at 11.30 a.m. Mm. And then we'd sit in my office, turn on the video recorder and record what came up to us, came up for us in our meditation And then pretty soon we started doing it with larger groups of people because people started hearing about it and people would come in at 11.30 a.m. every day and we'd meditate together. And pretty soon we started taking over a conference room and we'd draw on the conference room, you know, whiteboard. And then pretty soon people started quitting their jobs just to come meditate with us and hang out and draw and like all those kind of things. And that's how we were starting to build our company. And so meditation was a huge part of it. Eventually, I would get trained in what's called Transcendental Meditation, TM. And so I do that every day, twice a day, 20 minutes. Do you do TM? I don't do TM. I practice mindfulness and the Brahma Viharas, the loving kindness in Mm -hmm. particular. Ah, loving kindness. But I did meet the president of the David Lynch Foundation, Bob Roth. I have a lot of friends who practice TM. And it's I have Bob Roth is great. You know him? <laughs> so I, I've only met him once mm-hmm. uh, in person, but obviously we, we partnered together on a campaign mm. in 2015, giving tribute and thanks to our veterans. Mm. Amazing. So, uh, I but, have a lot of friends who practice TM. I have dabbled in Vedic meditation, but uh-huh. I, I do yoga as well. So I've done a whole bunch of meditation, but my daily practice is mindfulness and loving kindness. Oh, it's great. Uh, we had Vishen Lukiani on our podcast and he does loving kindness meditation. He, he does his three by three meditation method. But we'll go check no, so I do a ton of that for mindfulness. I invest in monotasking activities for mindfulness, being on a motorcycle, as scary as that is. The zoom of the engine is the meditation for my soul, right? The, it's the zoom of the engine is a mantra that keeps me focused on the road, monotasking, that's mindfulness, one-mindedness. Cooking is very mindful for me. Surfing is very mindful for me. It's you against mother nature in a battle. And you can only focus on one thing, which is your relationship to mother nature. Yeah, do those kind of things. That sounds great. Thank you so much. I appreciate hearing also how you speak about it, because I think that oftentimes our choice of words can 
communicate something different to different people, right? Monotasking yeah. is a wonderful term I will use again just to, yeah, because the great Thich Nhat Hanh, the Zen master, he was always saying, if you're washing a, a cup, you're just washing the cup. Be with mm-hmm. the water and the feeling and, the, and be in all of your senses as you are doing what you're doing. If you're, if you need to cry, go cry. <laughs> just do it one mindfully. <laughs> just do it, right? Mm-hmm. My friend Sally, she sent me this wonderful playlist that's a yoga nidra playlist by a woman named Ayla Nova on Spotify. And when I was going through my concussion, uh, uh, October, November, December, my post-concussive syndrome, I would spend three and a half to four hours a day in a dark room in my home office shower. And I would play these yoga nidra playlists, which are called NSDR, non-sleep deep rest. And it activates the same thing as like a meditative state, just in a variety of different ways. That's great. Now, we've covered a lot of things, and I appreciate... Have we? Yes. (laughs) A few things. (laughs) I just want to check before I ask you my quick fire round questions. Is there anything else that you would like to share that we haven't talked about? That's a loaded question. I've got so many things I want to share with them. Can we do another one in a few months? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I love, you know what, by the way, I think think this is what I'd share, is do not underestimate what you know. Do not underestimate how powerful your story is. And go out and seek opportunities that, that you can go and tell your story. And why I say that is I say yes to this podcast in order to learn from myself. Think about that for a sec. Yes, I care about all of you listeners. I love you. I'm excited to impact you. But you won't remember what I said tomorrow. You, you won't remember who I am tomorrow. But hope, hopefully you'll remember how I made you feel if you related to part of my story. But no, I say that jokingly. I say yes to podcasts because... I get to learn about myself through the variety of the questions that the interviewer asks. And what I'd highly recommend you all doing out there is go find a young person who's insatiably curious, might be studying journalism, and pay them some dollars per hour, maybe once a week, maybe once a month, just to ask you questions. So you can think about the different things that you know. Because the odds are you've already got enough wisdom and knowledge inside of you to last a lifetime. I think that there's a hidden fallacy around books and keeping on reading new books and searching for new ideas, new this and new that. No, no, don't read that next book. Don't go to that next new seminar. Turn within yourself. Start listening to the inherent wisdom that you're sitting on and then go out and build something based on that. It's, we've got a lot more good in us than we really realize. I'm really glad I asked that question. <laughs> Thank you for asking it. <laughs> now, can I turn your own signature question on you, Chris? Sure. If you Ask could it. give credit or thanks to one person in your life that you don't give enough credit or thanks to, who would that be? <laughs> To all of you listeners who hear my long pause, it's because I've been asked this question a lot and I actually try to come up with a new person every time. I believe her name is Donna, Donna Markland. She worked at my second rehab and she did a variety of different things at the second rehab. And one of the things that she would do is become a part-time bus driver of our of our group of merry pranksters that were living at the rehab together. My second rehab was in the woods on this luxury hippie commune in the state of Washington. It was very fancy. We had a live-in chef and we had uh, one, wonderful, you know, 17 brothers that we were there with and live-in counselors and all these kind of great things. And Donna would drive us 17 goofsters 
to different things every now and then. And one of the things that she drove us to was the movie theater to go see the newest action flick that had just come out. And, and I forget what, I, I need to ask her what that action flick was mm. that all the boys, all the brothers wanted to go to. The movie that came out at that exact same time was Mamma Mia. Okay, yeah, that's not and, really an action flick. Yeah, and so mm. for some reason, every single boy that was like a brother, all of us living together on this rehab in Washington, they all wanted to go to the action flick. Me and Donna went to Mamma Mia. And I just remember how much she normalized and prepared me for just the natural boyhood teasery and disdain that I would then face because I was the one boy who went to the chick flick. I was the boy that went to the musical. And by the way, Donna was at, is actually from Sweden. Her whole heart and soul is in that movie, mm. is in that band. And I went with her and we had a moment. And you know what? Every single time I got on that bus or every single time I saw her at Grey Wolf Ranch for the remainder of my stay, we shared the knowledge that we went to that movie together against all odds. We went against the mm. tide of everybody else going to that action movie. Mm. And I just never th thought to thank her for that. Mm. Yeah. Like That's I was lovely. the kid, I, I was the kid in rehab as sociable as I am and as loud as my mouth is and as many fights that I picked and the people that I talked to in town and the girls that I flirted with and the rules that I broke. I mean, I broke every rule in the rehab. I never graduated the rehab. I just left. I found books. I, I think I read 24 books in a five-month span. That's how little I came out of my own bedroom and bed. I sat in bed and just read those books or I'd be in town working out with Taylor Lanier. And Donna really was one of the great shining lights that pulled me out of my shell at that thing. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody else would tell you, no way, dude, you were a loudmouth. You were the most sociable guy there. I picked fights with everybody. It was great. Thank you so much. Now, what is a favorite word? And by that, I mean a word that you could tattoo on yourself or live with, at least for a while. I think serendipity. I started thinking of serendipity when in 2020 when we were producing our virtual gratitude experiences then called virtual gratitude dinners and I believe it was my friend Z who came back from one of those breakout groups and he said God it, it was just such a serendipitous moment of connection hey puppy How are you? He, he said, God, that was such a serendipitous moment of connection. Chris, you've really structured serendipity. And that's so missing from our world today. And he started doing a lot around structured serendipity. But I started thinking, how many times a day do we take for granted pre-pandemic that we would have a serendipitous encounter at the office water cooler? Or we'd serendipitously run into a friend at the same coffee shop. Or we do some kind of instantaneous serendipitous moment of connection and it'd make our whole day. And that was missing during the pandemic. And the virtual gratitude experiences that we were facilitating and the questions that we were asking and the breakout groups that we were creating was structuring this serendipity. And everybody started talking about it. And as a matter of fact, I almost changed the word that we dedicate our entire life to from gratitude to serendipity during the pandemic. But then we worked with a branding firm in September of 2020 and they said, nope, you should probably stick with gratitude. Yeah, I remember reading that chapter in the book where you talk about the water cooler. <laughs> oh, do I? So oh clearly, gosh. It's, it's, yeah. This feels like so, it's very you. So on Tuesday, March 13th, 22, no, wait, hold on. Let me get the exact date because that will just really, <laughs> really piss me off if I don't have the right date memorized. No, Tuesday, March 14th 
Wow. Mm. Yeah, Tuesday, March 14th, 2023. Mm-hmm. It was like eight or nine months after my book came out in June of 2022. And I'm sitting there looking at my book. Where is this exact copy? Anyways, I was sitting there looking at my book and I had an epiphany is that I had signed a copy of my book to so many people in the prior eight months, but I hadn't actually signed a copy of it myself, to myself. And I sat there on Tuesday, March 14th, and I signed a copy of my book, Gratitude Through Hard Times, to myself. And I realized in that moment, I hadn't actually read my book since I sent the book of course. to the printers of course. in May of 2022. I had a bad relationship with my book. I had a massive imposter syndrome. I did not think we wrote a good book. I convinced myself that nobody had read it. All these kind of things. And so I didn't really pay attention to my book for eight months after I published it. And we had the book launch party and multiple people read it and all these kind of good things. But March 14th, I signed it. And then the next day, March 15th, Wednesday, March 15th, I never take meetings on Wednesdays. I try not to take meetings on Wednesdays. I call them my no meeting Wednesdays. And that morning I woke up and I grabbed my book and I took some mushrooms and I got on the subway. And then I just sat on the subway and read my book for the next six hours. Oh, that's awesome. I got off at the <laughs> end. I, I went to the end of the train and back multiple yeah. times. I got off at the end of the L train in the way depths of the city. And I got off and carrying around my book. And I had my sweatpants and my big black puffy jacket on. And I always look like a bum. Unless I'm like going somewhere purposefully, I dress like a bum. And I remember I was on the mushrooms and I had my book in my hand. And I was just sitting there looking up at at the bus stop sign. And I was trying to figure out, hey, if I got on a bus, where could I go on the bus? And someone walked up to me. And she was holding a job fair flyer. I looked like someone who was in need of a job. I looked like someone who was studying the bus stop thing to look for like a job. And she came up with the job fair flyer and she said, there's a job fair going on right now. Mm. If you'd like to come to it, we can help you out. Wow. And I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there secretly holding my book (laughs) that at one point was number one on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. And I'm saying, wow. This is a good moment. And then I got back on the subway and I continued reading. Wow, what a story. Now, what does connection mean to you? That's an interesting word because you didn't ask me what human connection means to me. You ask what what connection means. Yes. You know, I'll never forget my friend Sarah. She led a a learning session on, 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 on a Wednesday a couple months ago for our speaker mastermind group, Impact 11. And she did a lot of inner child work on the call. And she had me shut my eyes and go back to a kid and do all these kind of things. And when I went back, I pictured myself as this kid who was always on the surfboard and I was always in relation to Mother Nature. And I was always riding one of her waves. And I was always doing these, be- these beautiful things on the water. I'm blessed to have been in- born and raised on the water. I'm blessed to be able to be very prof- proficient in the water. It's my home. And one of the things that I realized in that, in that memory is that 
every time as a kid I would come out of the water, there'd be a group of people on the beach waiting to talk to me. This was my childhood. Whether it was skimboarding, kite surfing, windsurfing, or surfing, or paddleboarding, there'd always be a group waiting and willing to talk to me. So much that my dad would come meet me down at the beach just so he could meet all those people and then sell them a home. We had a whole thing going on. It was a ruckus. It was a racket. But I realized that those people that knew nothing about me other than watching the way I surfed, watching the way I sat in Mother Nature's water, they wanted to talk to me. They learned about me through watching me connect with Mother Nature. And I realized in that meditation that Sarah was leading that the greatest form of connection I've ever felt and a connection that I'm looking to recreate in my life is when my heart and soul is put so seamlessly into something that it fills my whole soul to be a part of it. And that connection that I found as a kid in the waterways of Hilton Head Island, like in the passage of the book that I read at the start of the call, and how I would connect with Mother Nature through my surfboard and through my surfing, when I'm in that connection, people can learn as, as much about me just by watching me connect with Mother Nature than they'd ever need to hear about me through my words. And yeah, I just thought that was a beautiful thing. And, you know, now I get to help people, you know, get to know each other through the spaces that we create that creates meaningful moments of human connection. That the way people get get to learn from each other through this type of connection is better than any other style that you could get to know each other ever. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Absolutely. And that's why I don't want to focus the question on human connection because I think connection to nature and to the environment, to Mother Earth, to air, whatever that may mean for each guest. My, it's different. My friend Campbell Goss, my, my friend Addison's little brother, you know, he was just little Campbell growing up and now he's a, now he's a man with a, a beautiful bride and a wonderful company in Hilton Head, charter fishing company. And he just posted on TikTok or Instagram today a video of two dolphins swimming through the back channels, the salt marsh around Hilton Head Island. And he captured them on video. And the moment that he posted that I saw the video, I don't know if Addison shared it or, or I saw it somewhere, I felt such a tremendous feeling of connection and love for these creatures, for the, this water, for that salt marsh, for my home. And I just think if people, no matter if it's with humans or animals or with land or whatever, if we could just feel that, please, then no matter what the world is going through, we will survive it because we filled our heart with some type of soul enriching connection right there. That's the stuff that saves us. And I'm just so passionate about helping people find that. We do it in a very small way around the dinner table or with our gratitude experiences or through our keynotes or through our books or whatever. We're just doing our small little part, but everybody's got the opportunity to find something in their life and in the work that they do that they can put their love into in that way and find that moment of connection. Thank you. This next question is often very hard. <laughs> what song best represents you? <laughs> it's so funny that you asked that in that way. So my friend Susan Drum wrote a book. I can't reach it. But my friend Susan Drum wrote a book called The Leader's Playlist. And Susan helps CEOs, great leaders, essentially realize that the playlist that describes or is on repeat in a CEO's life likely leads them to do bad things as a CEO. 
Huh. And it, and if you just change the playlist, change the song, start to rewire some stuff, you can have a whole new outlook on your leadership and your life and your capabilities and all these kind of things. And I had Susan on her podcast to talk about her book. And so I read the book and I performed the playlist audit. And I had to look at my like top listen to oh my God. songs. And my number one most listened to song is number one, two, and three were all from the Hamilton Broadway play uh-huh. yes. soundtrack. Uh-huh. And it was all the songs about why do you write like you're running out of time, writing at night like you're running out of time, but you keep on smiling in the meantime, nonstop. What is that? That's like hustle, hustle, even if it's killing you, nonstop. Right. Another one of the songs was, I'm just like my country. I'm young, scrappy, and hungry. It's the idea of, I've got so much left to prove. Wait till you see what I can do. I've not done enough. I haven't even started. That's a lack of gratitude. Huh. That's me saying, I ain't done nothing. Mm. Wait till you see what I do next. Those were the songs wow. on the playlist. And then I read her book and I started shifting around the songs and all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, listen to this. Listen to how I really answer your question is now a couple of years after reading her book, my music tastes have changed and you know, Paul Simon is on it and all these kind of things. At the beginning of last year, 2023, I was having a conversation with my buddy Scott and Scott and I have always loved Paul Simon and Pearl Jam and Hootie and the Blowfish and all these kind of different things. But he started mentioning that he was going around to these different concerts of this one group, a wonderful dance EDM tech, kind of butchering the description, but a wonderful group based out of London. And him and his buddy, John Frazier, were, or our fraternity brother, John Frazier, were traveling around going to this thing. And in the 18 years that I've known Scott, I had never heard him talk about this band. But then the more I started listening to him talk about this band, the more I realized this is his favorite band of all time. This is actually probably his favorite thing of all time. Like more important to him than Neil deGrasse Tyson is to him, more important to him (laughs) than running is to him, more important to him than all these other things. Mm. And so I said, let me go on a journey. And in 2023, I started listening to his favorite Band. I watched every documentary. Mm. I watched every YouTube clip. I looked up all these different articles. I listened to so much of his favorite band, Above and Beyond, that in December of 2023, when I looked at my Spotify rap playlist, my number one most streamed artist of the year was Scott's favorite band, Above and Beyond. Oh, wow. And not only was it just a great experiential adventure learning a whole new genre of music that now I actually love, but it helped me get that much closer to my friend Scott. Now we text every morning about what different playlists we're listening to while we're working out. Mm. And so the funny thing is, to answer your question, I went from having a playlist that was centered around, I've not done enough. I'm a piece of crap. I got to hustle nonstop to let me go on an experiential, empathetic adventure, learning about the things that makes my friend most passionate and use that as a natural form of connection between the two of us. Yes, and Chris, the band is called Above and Beyond. Isn't that a very beautiful metaphorical answer to my question as well? It is. And by the way, I've never thought about the name, but you know, when we think of Marty Seligman's school of uh, positive psychology Mm -hmm. that my friend Marissa Lasher helped out on, you know, he, he, he says that there's a number of core virtues in this world, in the world of positive psychology. And one of the virtues is transcendentalism. It's the opportunity to go off and find a spiritual, holistic kind of higher power thing. And one of the actions that you can do underneath the virtue of transcendentalism in order to go above and beyond yeah. is gratitude. Ah, look. Gratitude at falls how under that transcendentalism. Ties together. That's crazy. 
That's beautiful. Mm. By the way, Above and Beyond is a fantastic band, and I, I love watching their deep, deep house sets with low melodic beats. Mm-hmm. Good for working out or good for reading and writing. And yeah, it's a wonderful thing. Awesome. I'll ask you to try and pick one song to send me later because I ask all of the guests in order to put together an Out of the Clouds playlist. And let me tell you, it's very eclectic. (laughs) So you would uh, not be shocked to hear Mm -hmm. uh, one of their most popular songs is literally called Gratitude. Oh, <laughs> it'll By be the a way, great it, addition. It took Scott 10 years to think about sending me the song Gratitude, no. but nonetheless, one of the most popular songs is called Gratitude. That's hilarious. I love it. Talk about serendipity. So. I mean, where is somewhere that you visited that you feel really had an impact on who you are today? I mean, Rome's the obvious one. <laughs> no, I'd say Harbor Island, Bahamas. Mm. Harbor Island is a, God, it must be three miles by one mile, tiny little island that I started going to as a kid. I'm an only child, and I was always yearning for brothers and sisters and cousins right near me on Hilton Head. And there was this one family, the Messier family, that adopted me as their 12th grandchild. I adopted them as my brothers and sisters and cousins. Rachel and Kathleen are the two closest things I have to what I call sisters. Outside of my immediate family, the 11 other grandchildren are like my cousins. I actually just had Marky and Sophia and Alice over for dinner. Me and Molly hosted a couple nights ago and my heart was happy. We went through photographs of old family vacations to the Bahamas. The one of the one of the leaders of the family owns a hotel down on Harbor Island, Bahamas. And every year, multiple times a year, we shut down the hotel and just be go down as a family. 30, 40 of us just as a family together for those 10 days. And we'd be we'd all be on property together. And that was just such a fantastic upbringing that carried on up until really like 2014, 2015. And that island was really a sense of home and connection. My roommate would always be Mateo, who's the youngest of the three brothers in one part of the family. And here he was 14, 15 and and me being 19, 20 or whatever the age difference was. And We're just sitting there listening to Pink Floyd and and having a good time. And those are all the closest moments I have to to having brothers. And we'd all fish together and we'd work together to go on scavenger hunts and all these kind of things. So Harbor Island will always have a forever, it's the best pink sand beach in the world by far. Mm. And in the family's hotel, Jenny invented the the best Goombay smash in the Bahamas. Mm. It was ranked as the best B- Bahamian drink in the Bahamas was the Goombe Smash at Runaway Hill. So it was a good, it was a good place to go. I am very sure that I've already looked at their hotel website. <laughs> by, <laughs> yeah, by, by the way, just in terms of its impact on me, mm. I remember one year when I was in college, spring break of 2008, myself and Rachel, one of those two people who like a sister to me, her and I went for spring break on Harbor Island together because I, I went to college in Florida. She went to college in North Carolina. So the Bahamas was very easy. And so it was just the two of us staying at the hotel. Paul was running the hotel, one of the, one of the senior members of the family. And it was that trip where I was in college. That trip, I would drink a whole bottle of booze a day. I would mix different drugs I would get in different fights on, I would get, I got myself in very precarious situations with the locals, with guns and all these kind of things over stupid stuff. And that's when Paul, one of the leaders of the family, called up my dad and said, he, yeah, he, he might need to go away for a little bit. You might need to work on this. And that was the exact phone call from Harbor Island 
that made my mom and dad say, yeah, all right, you're going off to rehab. And it was literally the next month that I went off to rehab. Wow. So a lot of history in, uh, on that island, but I'm grateful for it. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. Of course. Now, two more questions and I release you. Imagining that you can step into a future version of yourself. So there's a future you. What is the most important advice that you think future you needs to give to present time you? Be content. Learn how to be content. Stop running like you're running out of time. Stop riding at night like you're running out of time. Sleep. Be okay with where you are in the world. I'd like to think that I've done a few things. I've impacted a few people. Maybe I've done a number of enough things that I'd need to do for the rest of my life. Right? I, I believe wholeheartedly that my lack of being content, my lack of having self-gratitude, my lack of humility for my own accomplishments is my greatest deterrent in life. It creates disconnection from others. It creates the non-suicidal self-injury behavior and thinking within, it creates all the problems that I have. And I just yearn from, I learn, I yearn that one day in the future, I will be able to look back and say, that was the moment that he started living in the present, that he started appreciating what's going on and actually found some contentment with the things that he's done. I'm not there yet. At least I can acknowledge it. It but it's one of my greatest hopes. Thank you. And to my last and favorite question, what brings you happiness? So are we acknowledging that happiness is episodic and joy is a longer term period of this emotion? Okay. So what brings me episodic happiness? Uh, you know, the, there's really two types of happiness. There's the happiness, uh, that, that, that it's associated with hedonistic types of things like the acquisition of something or the achievement of something or whatever. And then there's the eudaimonic version of happiness that comes from finding meaning in the service of others. Um, what makes me happy in, in an episodic short-term format might be a good wave. So it might be when I'm deeply connected to another human, a very intimate moment with my partner, Molly, we connect in very intimate ways that I've never connected with another human. What to feel happiness when I'm releasing shame, guilt, regret, or anger. I go to special providers to help me with that. I wrote about it in the book, but I'm very involved in the kind of the BDSM kink community. I actually go to professionals, professional dominatrixes to help me through some of those stuck emotions of guilt, regret, anger, shame. And when they've brought me through a scene and we've successfully worked on one of those emotions, bliss and happiness is what I feel. And it's an absolute tremendous feeling. Yeah, I love winning. Happiness, when I get a, when I get a good deal, um, I feel happy for a moment. Mm -hmm. It's only a moment. Sure. It's only a moment. But in the moment, I'm like, yes, <laughs> I'm valued. Someone wants to pay me for something. This is great. <laughs> it, it doesn't last. Mm. It's like my friend Lisa Besserman told us on our podcast the other day, the minute that she reached Everest Base Camp, she absolutely felt nothing in the moment. And that's when she realized how much her life was formatted on reaching goals and milestones mm. and these very telic-based activities that had a fixed destination or endpoint. And she needed to start living in the moment. Mm -hmm. and doing things for the sake of doing them, not achieving them. Yeah. And so even though winning is good for a split second, <laughs> the feeling is fleeting. Mm -hmm. Like hitting number one on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list, I will say was a happy moment. Mm -hmm. I learned about it from our marketing partner, Tyler. And then I got to go to the store in between North 5th and North 6th Street and on Bedford Avenue in, in Brooklyn, New York. And I got to buy the paper, the physical paper, from this wonderful bodega. And then Molly and I walked to our favorite little bar restaurant in the neighborhood, Hotel Del Mano, and we had two cocktails at the bar. That was a very happy moment. The next day didn't mean shit. Yeah. 
So I'll tell you why. So first of all, thank you. <laughs> I'll tell you why I like to ask this question. When I was doing my mindfulness certification course, which lasted two years, we did a diet workshop where we were in a group of six. We went off in Zoom rooms in groups of twos. And for five minutes, one person asked the other, what brings you happiness? And then you'd say something and then she'd wait a moment, pause, and then ask again, what brings you happiness? And over the course of the following 10 minutes, what happened is that me and my friend Alba decided to continue to email each other every day, what brings you happiness? And what came up for us is that there are many things, the moments may be fleeting, but there are many things that can bring us happiness. And generally, they are not the things that you buy, right? They are not the things you require. If you ask yourself this time and time and time again, it tends to be the smallest moments in life of connection to yourself, to others. That's the context of why I really like to ask that question. And I delight in hearing what makes my guests happy. I have to say it's a wonderful thing to listen to. Thank you. Thank you for asking it. I think it, it's a beautiful question that I would imagine if someone was in a room for five minutes and someone kept asking the same question, how much of a, a variety of answers, how, how much deeper the it answers goes would go. It very fast. <laughs> well, it, but it's, it's such an interesting question is, um, it, so, so the concept isn't ask different questions to help someone go deeper. It's ask the same questions on, on a frequency of time to help someone go deeper. It, so many people think, you know, so, so I even had this conversation with my friend Charlotte Jackson one time outside of a coffee shop is that she was going into a three day silent retreat somewhere in, mm. in, in the woods. And she was trying to figure out what material, what new material she could go and meditate, what variety of material she'd go and meditate on for those three days. And I invited, I don't know if she did it or not, but what I invited her to do was just go in with one sentence and just meditate on that one sentence over and over and over and over and over and over again and go deeper on that thing. And I think she ended up doing that with just one passage. But it's we're, we're always programming ourselves to think, what are the variety of questions we can ask to get to a specific answer instead of just saying, keep asking the same question over and over again and you'll go deeper and deeper into your knowledge of it. Mm. I mean, we've got this one question. If you could give credit or thanks to one person in your life that you don't give enough credit or thanks to, who would that be? We've used it to, I mean, we've asked a lot of people. <laughs> and while we do answer or ask a lot of other questions, mm -hmm. it's that one thing, mm -hmm. that one question that I will be studying for the rest of my life. No greater joy. And what makes me happy is when I see someone out in the wild using something that we've created. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, my buddy Chris Matthews from Texas, someone emailed me a, a, a podcast that he was hosting where every podcast, he asked these big healthcare executives our signature gratitude question. I'm like, that's great. That's what makes me happy. Or a kid from West Virginia reading our book and saying, I want to host a series of dinner parties with the principles that you like that, that stuff makes me happy. Not the writing of the book, but people using something, <laughs> know, knowing what benef what great benefits will come because people are doing the same things that brought us great benefits. Mm. Thank you so much. I think this really wraps this up for us. I appreciate all the time you've given me, Chris. It's been such a joy to get to know you and to ask you my very many questions. So if people would like to get in touch, find out more about what you do and how can they find you and where? ChrisShembra.com mm -hmm. is a good exploratory or go listen to our podcast and check out our experiences at 747club.org or find us on LinkedIn, uh, Chris Shembra. We got a, a nice little following there and we're posting a lot of stuff on a frequent basis. Uh, we've had the tremendous pleasure and an honor to uh, write uh, 23 uh, articles for Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, and so definitely go read our column, oh, um, you know, there. 
And um, I don't know, just reach out, chris at 747club.org. And have any questions, comments, concerns, or criticisms that you may have. Thank you so much. That's very generous of you. And to our listeners, I highly recommend that you buy both Gratitude and Pasta and Gratitude Through Hard Times. And of course, connect with Chris's work. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful rest of the day. I Thank hope for th- many moments of serendipity for you in the, <laughs> in the days to come. And hopefully we'll connect in, pe- in person one day. Oh, I'm excited for that. And a big, another big thank you to our friend Danielle Spitzer, who, you know, we, we need more people in this world that look out for the opportunity to connect Absolutely. to people. And, and she did that and she brought us together. And I've had such a tremendous time on this podcast. You know, I go on a lot of podcasts and I must say, you've certainly been the most well-researched and well-prepared and have asked a tremendous variety of questions of things that are near and dear to my heart. So many times... I have to go on a podcast and talk about the business I've built and how it benefits companies. But you actually got me to talk about my childhood and and uh, you know pasta sauce and surfing and dolphins. And <laughs> I read from Pat Conroy. This has certainly been the most unique interview I've ever been on. Oh, thank you. And I have to say I'm that was the most that. unique introduction to my episode as well. Because I did not ask you what is your favorite book because I now know and I am going to go and buy this. I can't God, it's so wait good. to read it, honestly. <sighs> yes. My whole heart is in this book. Oh, that's awesome. I will send you some, <laughs> I will send you my notes when I've read it. I can't wait because I love the film and. Deal. Yeah. Awesome. Have a wonderful day. Say hi to Molly because now I feel like I know her as well. And, and hopefully we'll connect soon. So, friends and listeners, thanks again for joining me today. If you'd like to hear more, you can subscribe to the show on the platform of your choice. And if you'd like to connect with me, you can find me at Anvi on Threads, on Instagram, and Vimulatala on LinkedIn. If you don't know how to spell it, the link is in the notes. Or on Instagram at underscore out of the clouds, where I also share daily musings about mindfulness. You can find all of the episodes of the podcast and much more on the website outoftheclouds.com. If you'd like to find out more from me, I invite you also to subscribe to The Meta View, my weekly newsletter where I explore coaching, brand development, conscious communication, and the future of work. That's The Meta View with two Ts, themetaview.com. So that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening to Out of the Clouds. I hope that you will join me again next time. Until then, be well, be safe, and take care. Hey there, it's Anne again. I've got something important to share with you today. Are you struggling to connect with your audience? Feeling like your brand has lost its sense of purpose? Is motivating your team feeling like an uphill battle? Well, my passion is to bridge coaching, consulting and storytelling to create meaningful communication and strategy that drive purpose. So let me introduce you to AVM Consulting. That's my gig, so to speak. It's my company. I offer a blend of coaching, consulting, aka advisory services, and storytelling services, all aimed at helping your brand connect authentically, rediscover its purpose, and inspire you and your team to greatness. One of the keys to success is connecting your brand to its core values. When you align with what truly matters, you attract the right clients and create meaningful, long-lasting connections. And remember this quote, The magic you're looking for is in the work you're avoiding. Sometimes the most powerful transformations happen when we tackle the challenges head on. With a proven track record of success in building incredible brands and communication strategies globally, I'm here to be your trusted partner 
in achieving your vision. So are you ready to transform your brand and make some real magic happen? Don't wait another moment. Let's schedule your free exploratory consultation now and take that first step towards unlocking your brand's full potential. Now learn more about what AVM Consulting can do for you. Click on the link in the notes or head directly to avm.consulting.